And um, I, I, I'm, as a drama therapist, I'm very aware of the patients from the hospital in Epidaurus who were actually sent to the theatre to be healed, and that was before Christ. So our origins were <laughs> like way back. And I know that other art therapists can tell you other stories from their own modalities. And for those of you who are unclear, and I don't want to be preaching to the converted, but for those of you who don't know, there are four modalities of art therapy. Uh, there's uh, dance and movement, there's music, there's art, and there's drama. And all of these modalities were represented here tonight, and I really hope that you had an opportunity to experience at least one of those workshops. Um, and for those of you also who are unclear, I just want to mention that arts therapists are artists first and foremost, okay? They then train in, in the psychotherapies and use their art form consciously in order to use it as a treatment to bring about change. Um, art therapists know the power that art has to reach places that other therapies can't, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, we know the power of art and creativity and of working in a creative partnership between artists and art therapists and at the heart of our trust art policy is this collaboration and it's really really important uh, it's very important that people have access to both ways of working uh, and at different times and different phases in their lives and their treatment. And we need to understand the values of both ways of working. Uh, both therapeutic art and <coughs> art therapists start with a person and are committed to letting the individual find a voice in the middle of pain and confusion. Art therapy training, and I just want to talk about that for a minute, works with the problematic thoughts and material that, and act, that act as a bridge between the unconscious and the conscious to bring about change. It's very oversimplified that, um, but that's why we put on the experiential workshop, so that you've got an idea of how that might happen. And art therapists sit in the multidisciplinary team and hopefully bring about a language which is different and adds to the other models of understanding the whole patient and the whole person. However, we are under threat. We are seen as easy cuts. We know that the patient experience of art therapy is very, very positive. It doesn't come more powerful than a service user talking about how the experience of art and <coughs> art therapy saved her life. And research is very important for us. Um, I believe there are other people going to talk about this. Um, and we'll put it in the context of Edward Adamson and his work. Um, but I, as SLAM's Art Therapy Advisor, I want to stress the commitment we have in trying to understand and develop our practice. I'm not going to go on about that, but we are looking at ways of working in, in all kinds of ways, and we're looking at feasibility studies at the moment in dementia and drama therapy, music therapy in an acute forensic setting, um, art therapy in CAMS, uh, to name just a few. And please be aware of the art recovery, art and recovery uh, exhibition that's going to uh, be 
the next thing that happens in our long gallery. We're very sad to see the Adamson collection go down, but we know that, the, that this space is going to be used to uh, put, put forward other ideas and other, other people's work, and, and that's brilliant too. Tonight we're really lucky because we have a panel who I am sure are going to inspire us, to inspire us to, to, to think about the wonderful legacy of Edward Adamson. So on this panel we have David Ophind, Dr. David Ophind, um, and without David the Adamson Festival wouldn't be happening. And David is the chair of the Adamson Collection and the festival director and he's also a consultant psychiatrist here in this land. We have Michael Barham, Barham, who is a very well-known figure in, in the world of drama therapy uh, and has been director of the Adamson Centre for Professional Practice at the University of Redhampton. Uh, he was also the chair of the British Association of Drama Therapy uh, and was invited by the Secretary of State to create what we know now as our sort of governing regulation body, really, HCPC. Uh, and he was also or has been awarded an NHS Excellency Award. We've also got De uh, Dr. Amy Harding, uh, who's a research clinical psychologist at the IOP and at SLAM. And it's fantastic to have Amy here because, again, that's another partnership which is really, really important. We have Val Hewitt, and I've asked Val to introduce herself more when she talks. Uh, but she is the Chief Executive of the British Association of Art Therapists. And we are incredibly honoured tonight to have John Timman here. And John, John, you're not going to speak, but... Uh, oh, no, no, you are going to speak, but you're going to speak as part of the panel, asking, answering questions. And there's no one that knew Edward better than you, I guess. Absolutely. So it's really fantastic that you're here. So I don't want to hold things up anymore. I just want to keep things going. We're going to have some short talks from everyone. And then the important thing is that our sharing of ideas and questions and uh, after that. So we'll have time for that. David, over to you. Thank you. And it'll be important why I get my computer to work. I can get my gun. But like Joe, I feel I'm sort of bringing the tone down after what's been a, a really wonderful afternoon. Oh, that's promising, isn't it? <laughs> Is something on the screen? Let's see if it makes that <coughs> So, sorry about that. Um, there's always going to be a bit of a technical brief to hand over. Thank you all. It's been such a joyful kind of occasion. And um, the, the whole festival has been running since February. It's going on until July. Is celebrating really what the work of two men, Edward Adamson and his partner John Timmon, who is here with us today. I think the main things they brought to us was a celebration of the creativity of people who were living in asylums as early in the early 1940s. And out of that celebration and encouragement of the creativity of people, they developed ideas about art of therapy and also the idea of the art student and I'll come back to those again later. But also the creator of this amazing art collection, the Edmondson Collection, which has been on the light boxes around the building today, has also been very much part of the slideshow on the main screen. And um, the festival's been a big operation. There's been three exhibitions, still two tilt, two still running, one at the Morsigon Gallery and one at the Bethel Museum. We've had two major events, including this one tonight. The first event, the opening event, included the premiere of a movie about a guy called Kurelek. And then it's very much celebrating the history of Adamson. Tonight has been much more about reflecting on what Adamson's work might mean now or these years later. So tonight is about, as we've been saying, celebrating all the creativity, the slide shows the music, also celebrating creative arts therapies. And raising, I think, the, there has been a separation between the two, possibly. There has been the idea of some art is created very privately, and that's called outsider art. Some art is created in art studios run by occupational therapists and artists, and that's called art mental health. And some other art is created in places, therapeutic spaces. And I think, as an outsider from it all, 
I think there have been some maybe separations of those lines, and I think something I want to explore today briefly. Many therapists in the room correct me. So Edward Adamson was born in 1911, died in 1906. He was a British artist, pioneer of art therapy, and the creator of Edmondson Collection. His part John Timlin as a writer, teacher, and worked with Edward for over 30 years, particularly on the promoting the collection. I'm going to focus on really Edward's time at Nevin Hospital. So Nevin was one of the old mental asylums, opened in the 1920s, is now executive housing. It looks, this is a sort of nice photograph of the place, it's pretty full of horror and misery in 1946. It was a time of, the hospitals had a bad wall, they were very poor, they were very underfunded, lobotomies, instant chemotherapy, it was in its heyday. So the fact that Edward went to this place in 1946 was quite remarkable. And he took a very early form of art therapy that had been developed in the TV sanatoria, which was about teaching people art as a therapy, as opposed to expressing freely. Then he was employed to run a, a very psychiatric art research studio, which I won't go into much today because it, it's really, it's a, it's a separate item. But well, after the main psychiatrist, Conan Dax, left that studio, Edward basically subverted it for the next 30 years to create this space that people were allowed to come and express freely. And that, just, I was comparing that to the other photograph. This is a, one of the pictures of Nelson Hospital from the collection. Those two, the dustbins with the name Broad, Broad, there's a Broad, Broad, Broadwood Villa in the ground. So, I was about somebody painting some dustbins and a fence as the main experience of the island. I thought it compared nicely with the official photograph. To tell a very complicated history very briefly, in about 1920, 1921, psychiatrists started, and I said, telling a story really simply, but psychiatrists started recognizing art objects made by patients in asylums as works of art. And until that time, people just found materials, they'd do things in secret, they often got destroyed, but some of the remains survived. In 1946, this idea of the workshop started appearing, and <coughs> interestingly enough, the first two workshops I'm aware of, one was in Nevin Hospital, and the other one was in Rio de Janeiro. We have two of our friends from Rio here tonight, Euripides and Christina, who are part of the Museum of the Unconscious. And we're fascinated by the fact that in these two hospitals, in two separate continents, the same idea came up, to provide a space, to provide materials, to provide an artist to guide people. We have 5,000 works, our, client, our friends have 350,000 works, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, we've already, um, and I think Edward's work and the work in Rio did create this thing in the art studio, and the art studio carries on to this day. A part of the first one that I missed was um, the Beth and Gary, Beth Elliott and Carla Ross <coughs> recreated Addison's studio in the studio of the Beth room. And they're used to, the people, these artists are used to working at tables. And they find it really in, difficult to work, like Edward, Edward's working was, in your, you had your own little island, you had your own <coughs> easel, your own materials. There was a bit of a hangover from the research studio. But the people in this experiential workshop during the festival found it really strange to be not in a group on a table chatting, but to be in their own little space. But this is a shot from Edward's studio, um, probably in the early 1960s. The patients haven't got uniforms anymore. They thought they could have been wearing costly uniforms. And that's uh, the tall figure that obviously Edward. So that one legacy is with the creation of the art studio. He wasn't the only person doing it, but he was a phenomenal person to explore the idea and develop it. The second was his therapeutic practice. And again, he developed a way of working in an art setting, which was about free expression. It was about the notion that the act, the gesture creating art is what mattered. That was what was therapeutic. How not to interfere, impinge. He didn't praise, he didn't criticize, he just let the process unfold naturally. He was very anti-interpretation and a-theoretical, he, he did disagree with theoretical positions. He didn't like interpretation of pictures. And that, his work is very instrumental to art therapy, as I'm sure Bell will tell us later. But he certainly, he's, there was ways part in the 70s, and 
also it became quite interesting in psychoanalysis and Edward was really not in agreement with that kind of way of working. And that's something hopefully we can discuss. I take these two quotes because I think they sum up Edward's position perfectly. The first way is to say it's the work that matters. I particularly like the fact that if they try and paint, they didn't need to paint, just to try and paint, to try and sing, to try and dance. That's all you need to do to get better. And this anti-interpretation. He, he loved the person telling the story of the work. He didn't think other people should be interpreting. And as he says, it's the easiest thing in the world to tell a full story. And the, the fear, you know, the therapist finds in their work. And people here might disagree, but I'm too good with Edward's position. I, he clearly wasn't working in Ireland. There's a huge history behind him, and I simplified the, the story a lot. He was clearly, his art, he went to art school, his art training was important. He always identified himself as an artist. He must have been aware of the influence that asylum art was having on surrealism and German expressions in the days of the art student in the 20s and 30s, he must have been aware of the influence that the interest the surrealists had in this other one. I think, I think there was something about the Second World War and the euthanasia about people with mental health problems that led to the changes after the war. And I wonder if that's a fact in the, the pencil studios in different places. So things seem to be very different after the war. He was a, a content of the director, he, was a, he had trained a chiropractor to see what in the UK who were with soldiers. And I think obviously that. That were the content of injured people coming back from the front must have had an effect. Adrian Hill, John Timlin, Edward Adamson, they're all gay men working in the 40s and 50s. At the time it was very difficult to go be a gay man. It's illegal, criminalised. These, so these men were living lives that probably echoed lives in the science. I mean, no, I think there are possibly connections there. Maybe these men understood these people being in excluded in the science because these men had to live and kill the rest every day. And that's an area that we haven't really explored, but I think it's, I think it's relevant. All art therapists, I think, have owe a debt to Carl Jung and his work in the 1990s, I think, that's undeniable. And Edward Evans was very much involved with British Jungians, particularly Irene Champion, who set up one of the first art therapy colonies, of therapeutic colonies in 1942. And he was very involved in a group of it. Jungians called the Independent Group, who's sort of anti transference and very much into dream analysis. And John Timmon told me recently that Edward Adamson read a lot, read a lot of Buddhist, Buddhist texts. And I never met Edward, but people knew and said he was a very quiet man, he never lost his temper, he was very. He was in the, and Rebecca Hofberger, who wrote, was one of the museum in Baltimore, called him the British Buddhist. So he had a man, he had a serenity to him, and I think that's an important part of what he did. And he was, certainly became much more interested in outsider art, the art of the untrained and excluded, before the tour of his life. How am I doing for time? Um, I, um, I'll you up. Oh, fine. The third main thing they did was to create this Edinson collection, which is this phenomenal collection of 5,000 works. <coughs> and they exhibited that widely from 1948 till a year before Edward's death. And I can wind up with more. Here. Um, collection now, it was in quite a lot of trouble. It was, it was, it was decaying in the hospital corridors and hospital shelves. So recently, the Edmonton Collection Trust have been working with the Welcome Collection to save the collection. And I guess we see the objects in the collection, the paintings, the drawings, the sculptures, as being clinical material. They were made by people to make themselves better. But they are also historical artifacts that have survived from those times. And I think they are also works of art, and that's maybe an area of discussion, debate. And the meaning of the objects gets changed as I move. And I'm going to stick to these slides really quickly, just to give you an overview of one thing. So this is one of nine, 14 drawings by a man called JJ Beaver we have. This is toilet, mat, burnt matchsticks on toilet paper. The only materials he had. The only other materials he had was the nurse's blue <coughs> pencils and pages he tried to library books. There's a man in Lock Ward in 1946, he had nothing else. This summer they, are, they were transferred to this huge exhibition in Paris. They were transported to London in three containers with treated as relics. This isn't being installed in high 
high quality museum conditions, now in a catalogue, because in art dealers are offering the trust any money to buy them off. So, objects made by a man to survive in a lot war, 1946 with his toilet paper burnt matches, become now highly valued, highly prized, and highly sought after art objects. That's what we know about the transformation of meaning. They weren't meant to be in a gallery, but they've ended up in a museum. The similar, this is um, the works used to be in Lambeth Hospital, and this is what 4,000 works on paper look like on, on stacks on shelves. That's one burst water pipe we've taken the whole collection out. And so, one summer they, they were moved, and this is the decontamination lamp that they're working. So they go from that stored on the shelves in the space of a week to being these high-tech labs at the Wellcome yeah. Library, and now they're stored in sort of bomb-proof conditions under the use of the And yes, this is the wonderful work of a woman called Gwyneth Rowland. She painted on flint, some of the most amazing works. This is, you can probably guess the NHS carpet. This is the floor of my office. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all wrapped in newspaper in my cabinet, in my filing cabinet. This is one example, a large one, it's about two foot high. It's amazingly beautiful, it's now valued £20,000. And it ended up in this exhibition, not too much, so, so other things. Again, she painted the survivor asylum. She was in hospital for 35 years. She lived her life in hospital. She painted the films to survive. Now they are in Nottingham being prized as these valuable objects. And I think I will leave it there. Is that okay? Is that too <laughs> simple? he was captured in Crete by the German army and eventually sent to Stalag 383, a prisoner of war camp in Bavaria. Here, not surprisingly, he became terribly depressed and suicidal until a chance conversation with a fellow prisoner who encouraged him to draw and paint. And this was the turning point. 
Increasingly, over time, his art making has become more playful, filled with light and sunshine. The depressed man was Terry Frost and his teacher, Adrian Heath. And interestingly, every photo I think I've ever seen of Terry Frost as, a, as an older man, he has a wonderful smile. Um, two days ago I was with Linda Frost, just outside Penzance, who, interestingly, um, told me all about the dramas that the inmates <coughs> regularly performed. Endless games of ping pong played with bats but no balls. <laughs> and weekly excursions called Back to Blighty, where they would enact catching a train back to England, taking, talking through the various stations they would pass, with different prisoners taking on all the roles. The Germans, of course, thought they were insane. But uh, interesting how it kept them healthy, it kept them alive. We, we mustn't overlook the power of pretending. And Interestingly, too, these events have now been made into a play and, uh, by Dan Frost, Terry's grandson, uh, and Edward Elks, with the role of Terry taken by Dan, who is, again, is, is the same age now as his grandfather was at that time. The play is called Stalag Happy. I don't know if anybody here has seen it. It's, it's going to be performed again. Uh, Next January, at Tate's and Eyes, when there's a major Terry Frost retrospective. Now let's go back even farther. Screen all moves or whatever, helps your imagination. Way back to 1939, a young man, 27 years old, is sat on a raised dais in a hall full of people. He's very nervous. While waiting, his mind drifts back to being a child. He attended boarding school in Sussex, where he and the other boys were extremely unhappy. In fact, they were so unhappy that they created a suicide club. He and other members of the club would go out onto the downs and enact dramatic scenes in which various teachers were symbolically killed. These enactments that helped young men not to kill themselves after all, but to find hope and try to believe life must be better after school. We could see and feel the difference after such sessions. This person was, of course, Peter Slade, a name that will mean something, I hope, to all the drama therapists here, but maybe not to, to others. If Edward was the Buddha, Peter, I would describe as the pixie. Uh, tiny, um, lovely twinkle in his eyes, and, and full of energy. So this man, nervous man, stands and gives his prepared talk. He's politely received, although the questioning becomes very heated and aggressive, but he tries to stand his ground. The talk he's given was entitled, Drama Therapy as an Aid to Becoming a Person. His audience is the British Medical Association. And this is the first time that we know of that the word drama therapy being used. Uh, and unlike in the programme here, it is one word uh, in England. Um, and uh, the American model is two separate words. Peter very deliberately wanted it to be one word because it was something new. And he thought it had more force as well. Uh, what he goes up saying when he was interviewed sometime later, doctors thought it was ludicrous and they were all terrified of imagination. I used to say, if your patients are going to do drama with me or with anyone else and they're imagining a lot, then we start with the imagination because that's where they are. And it's a really important phrase about starting where the patient is. And it's interesting preparing this and thinking about this, um, the similarities between Peter uh, and Edward and things happening at that time. And what of Edward? Well, as, as uh, interesting, because none of us 
particularly knew what each other was talking about today. Um, so there, there, there are, of course, periods of pieces of overlap. Um, the, and so I was going to talk then about the, the early visit and, and uh, the, these toilet pieces of toilet paper and drawings, um, which, which we've called uh, the, the, the man J.J. Began. Uh, we have no idea who he was. The, the, the registers, etc., uh, as far as I'm aware, don't, don't still exist. Um, but if you look at, if you can make it out on, on the bottle at the bottom, uh, it says J.J. Began in writing. Uh, and as David said, these were done with a, a charred matchstick on hard toilet paper. Some of us are old enough to remember that from our grannies. Uh, and uh, had, had the desperate need of people to create in very difficult circumstances in a, in a lot ward. And it seems clear to me that the, that, that man he only shuffled up to Edward on his early visit, pushed something into Edward's hand, shuffled away. When Edward smoothed it out and looked at it later, it was these drawings. Um, so there's something there about a gift being given to Edward and Edward's acceptance uh, of that gift for me. And as, as David said, we find more, more of those drawings later in, in blue pencil. So focusing on Peter Slade and Edward Adamson, it can be argued that they followed the same pattern in the development of their respective professions, something I've been involved in a, a lot. Um, eventually they group with other people who have developed dramatic and artistic theories and ways of working. This is followed by the development of specialist trainings, professional associations and negotiations to establish a unique identity and practice. During this stage, there's a significant increase in the publication of books and articles documenting art and drama therapy theory and practice. This is real proof. This is a real serious subject. Music and dance movement therapy have also followed this model. And of course, uh, again, as David touched on, Edward was the first chair of BAAT in 1963-64. Says so different dates in different publications, so I'm not sure which it was, um, and it, he was involved in the creation of the first training at St Albans where he was the course leader in the early 70s. At the beginning of this festival, in this very building, um, just a short time ago, uh, I was interviewed and filmed saying that Edward didn't tell people what to do and he didn't interpret. He enabled and he accepted. I'll try not to do any funny hand movements this time as I'm speaking. Uh, and so for me there's something very powerful in that encounter between human beings when acceptance is involved. Sounds very simple um, from my experience. And I don't think I'm the only one in this room. I would say it isn't. Uh, I'm sure many of you would agree. Um, being with psychotic people, uh, and very ill people sometimes can be very scary, and press all the right buttons. Um, and it seems to me the only answer really is, is one's own therapeutic process. Uh, and the deeper one goes into one's own chaotic darkness, so the more comfortable one becomes and the more one can be with someone else in a space, so that a real meeting uh, can occur. Actually, it, it's, um, it's not strictly true uh, that Edward always accepted. <coughs> Gwyneth Rowlands, who David mentioned uh, just now, uh, she lived at Nedden Hospital for over 30 years. Uh, started by collecting and painting butterflies copied from books. And there are hundreds of them in the collection. You either like them or you don't. Uh, they have a certain kind of folk art quality to them, maybe. Um, and then one day Edward suggested to her that she might like to try painting something else. Just this gentle nudge seems to have inspired something within her as, as her later works, painted on flint sourced from the fields around the hospital, 
are some of the treasures in the collection. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, we have the great joy and luck being trustees um, in David's office of, of looking at these flints and turning them to see them in all their three-dimensionality because they are, they are um, staggering works of art where she's really looked at the stone and drawn something from the flint um, to really use the space uh, of the flint. So there's the human skull of woman. Mother and child. So, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's the exception that proves the rule, really. The, another story, um, fast forwarding, a man, not so young this time, uh, is visiting the Adamson Collection at Lambeth Hospital for the very first time. It's 2010. He had read art as healing nearly 30 years before, and it had a profound effect on him. He is mesmerised by the paintings hanging in the corridors, and completely blown away by the flints. And he has his very own consultant psychiatrist <coughs> guiding him around the hospital. Who's very erudite about it all. Um, but then he sees, and you saw this just now, the bulk of the collection stacked on a shelf in an office. With a Kurilek, probably the possibly the most probably, definitely actually the most valuable painting in the collection. Worth a lot of money. Uh, as Canada's kind of leading artist. Um, wrapped in a blanket under a desk. And finally, he visits the Holy of Holies, the Adamson Archive, what's left, um, where he is met by a door. And uh, I just could not believe my eyes. There was this valuable collection uh, in a disused shower. Ironic in a way, because of course Edward's first um, space at Nether was, was a disused shower bowl. And here we were again in a disused shower. And I was terrified that the pipe could burst at any time. Some jobs worth could decide to turn the water back on and it would be ruined. So I, I gave David a tough time. Uh, his response was to insist I become a trustee. <laughs> uh, and in a short space of time, these photos were taken in 2012. Here we are today, you know, moving towards the end of, of this fantastic festival. Most of the artwork is now secure at the welcome. Uh, an enormous amount has happened, mainly down to David. Uh, but an enormous amount has happened. And that man, anyway. Uh, so, moving on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> The, everything I've, oh, there's the inside of uh, that shower, one, one of the showings. <coughs> everything I've set up until now has been history. And what I'm, I'm interested in history, but what I'm really interested in is the future. And uh, so, where do we go now? And hopefully the, the questions and answers, or if you see David, myself, or Harvey, I can't see Harvey. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, another trustee. Um, please do bend our ears this evening. But questions like, should we still be attempting to keep the collection all together here in the UK? It's very expensive to try to keep a collection like this. Should we inaugurate an annual Adamson Award of, say, £500? for the best essay that explores and continues Edward's ideas? <coughs> Should we compile a catalogue raisonné of all the works in the collection and publish it? Should we begin to curate exhibitions and talk increasingly about individual artists within the collection to give mainly women who have been denied recognition for such a time their long overdue recognition? And how do we fund this <laughs> I was struggling with how to end this talk, and it was my last day at work at the university uh, a week ago yesterday. And I was standing in a queue, as you do, 
for a cup of tea with a friend, a friend I've known for over 25 years. <coughs> and he started joshing, going on about how it's a life of luxury for you from now on. So I said, well, actually, I'm giving a talk next week as part of the closing event at the Adamson Festival. And I need to think about that. And out of the blue, he said, oh, he was my therapist. <laughs> No idea. So I, asked, I sat with him and asked him to write some stuff down. And this is what he said. I was in a training group run by him in 1973-74. I can only assume his approach was similar to his work with patients at the Nether Hospital. The first thing to note is that he had a particular presence. He was very tall and always immaculately dressed. Tailored suit, starched white shirt, tie and handmade shoes, always highly polished. As students, we sat at tables making our images. He just walked around, hands behind his back, slowly making his presence felt without interfering with our creative process. Occasionally, I would become conscious that he was standing behind me, looking at what I was making. And it would be at those moments that he might pass a comment or ask a question. And that was his approach, one of nurture of the creative space, of facilitating, holding the space, providing the necessary psychological boundaries. At the end of the term, we each received our feedback from Edward, usually a single paragraph, and that was it. Thank you. My name is Michael Barham. This is my story.